people it's going to be on. Oh, there you go. Hey. hey. There you are. There we are. Too loud. You can turn it down just a tad. It's echoing through my brain. I don't know. All right, please um, get your handouts for the third lesson in the book of Daniel. Um, we have a lot, uh, some good things, very good things to cover today as we look at this uh, young man and his friends. Um, it's such a privilege to go through this book, as we've mentioned. It's a big picture book. It's about a great and wonderful, sovereign God, a covenant-keeping God who is rules over the nations and individuals as he moves history forward to accomplish his purpose and plan, and that's to set the Lord Jesus Christ on display for all eternity as the King of Israel and the nations, the consummated kingdom that's coming to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians, right? God gives him the name above every name so that every knee is going to bow to him and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. That's what it's all about, the glory of God. And we will see as we look at Daniel's life that God uses him, uses him up, and gives himself to Daniel in the midst of it. And people, it's never going to be about you and me. It's always going to be about the glory of God. He's going to use us up to that end in whatever way he sees fit. But we'll get him as a result. That's the key. He gives himself to you as he uses you up. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive into the text. Father, we thank you for this time together in this marvelous book penned so long ago. And yet because you are the divine author of it, inspiring Daniel to record it for us, it, 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 it fits in with the totality of Scripture as you are setting forth for us a plan and purpose from the very beginning before time to exalt the second person of the Godhead the Lord Jesus Christ as the ruler and redeemer of creation. And, and in doing so, he is the revealer. He's the revealer of you, God, to us. So help us to see you in this book. Help us to see how you work through your servants to bring glory to your name. And so we just give our time to you now. We're, we're such a needy people. Um, we need you, dear Spirit of God, to superintend over the Word, to penetrate our hearts with it, to help us to see your beauty, dear Lord God, and ultimately to see that in the face of Jesus Christ. So thanks for this time. Thanks for these dear people who want to know and learn and grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are, Lord Jesus. We give this time to you for the glory of God the Father. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> And a lot of notes, again, I give you notes because I, I know you're going to go back and read them and think through them and enjoy them, right? Uh, it's, it's fun to do that for me, and uh, we, have a, we have a number of things, good things to talk about. In this section of Daniel, we're, we're going to see Daniel and his three companions resolve, <laughs> resolve to not defile themselves with the food and the drink coming from the pagan table of King Nebuchadnezzar. And the way they handle it, uh, this critical requirement from the king, I hope will be instructive to us living in a very dark land, becoming darker all the time. Okay? We're also going to see how God is present to accomplish his sovereign will for his faithful followers. Uh, there, there's such good correspondence between what's happening with Daniel and how our lives unfold with the same God. We're relating to the same God and, and how he works and moves. He even moves on the heart, we're going to see, of an unregenerate of official to grant the young men favor 
And he then blesses their studies such that they graduate at the top of their training class and enter the king's service. It's just magnificent to see why God is doing this, how he's doing it, and the fact that he is doing it. (laughs) So, let's just look at verses 8 through 16 first. Daniel's resolve not to compromise his faith. And it's not just Daniel. It's Daniel and his three companions, his friends. Same kind of heart. So, Daniel's decision and his appeal to the head of the court officials, 8 through 10. But Daniel made up his mind. And remember, he's commander of the officials was assigned, and they have to go into this training program. They're going to be educated three years. Uh, they have a regimen of uh, even food, and we're going to talk about that. But the bottom line is, in the midst of this, when the decrees are coming down concerning their training, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials, that he might not defile himself. All right. After hearing what the king commanded, the young men, for the young men, concerning the food regimen, he expected them to follow. The text tells us that Daniel made up his mind. They all did. They made up their mind that they're not going to be defiled by participating in this. No doubt... The food regimen, along with living quarters and other needs being met on a level suitable to nobility, would allow for the candidates enlisted in the training program to give their undivided attention to becoming proper advisors to the king, okay? That's often the way it works when you're in a training program. Listen, silly example, but when I was at the Air Force Academy, man, they met all of your needs in every sense of the word so you could become an Air Force officer and learn and grow and study and all that stuff. Same thing going on here. They fed us. Really good, by the way. But the bottom line is it had a goal to become, for them, a proper advisor to the king. Um, And get... Remember, they, 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 they took them as youths because it's easy to mold the young people to the position you want them to adopt. And so uh, this preferred treatment would serve to endear the king to them. You know, where I'm obligated. Look at how he's treating me. To endear the king to the candidates and then give the candidates a sense of obligation to the king he wants to promote their faithfulness to him and the kingdom in spite of being foreigners who have been brought in. So there's a plan, there's a purpose he's, uh, that he wants, and he's knitting them to himself, in a sense, with this wonderful treatment. Nobody else in the kingdom got this kind of food or privileges or housing. But Daniel and his friends, his three friends, have a higher allegiance and faithfulness driving them. Man, this is what's so wonderful. And because of that, the food issue is critical, a critical one that they had to deal with in order to obey the law of their God in this pagan land of Babylon. It's critical. Tanner has a good some good explanation here. So let me read through this for us as we move into page two. But he said, such a diet reflected a lifestyle, of course, in which godly values, the values that are contained in the law of God, were ignored. For the Hebrew youths, the diet meant defilement. Though we are not told specifically 
what the nature of the violation was. And, and, and perhaps this involved a violation of the Old Testament dietary laws. And you can go to Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14, and you know those laws. There were clean and unclean animals that they could eat or not eat. But all of that had a purpose in terms of why God gave that to them. And you can see that in Leviticus 11, 14 through 45, where God at the end of this chapter on food says, for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves <coughs> unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. <coughs> for I, the Lord your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. You get the point. What's the point is to be holy. You're set apart for me. They don't want to violate that. They don't want to be defiled with that. Uh, prohibition against eating unclean foods. Let me, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Another possibility is that these foods were considered defiled because they were the product of a pagan sacrificial system, okay? According to Exodus 34, 15, God says this, For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifices made to another god, see? So that's unacceptable. Um, god's people were forbidden to eat foods that had been sacrificed or offered to pagan deities or idols. In Babylon... Food was served to idols and later eaten by the king's court. And here's, here's how it worked. There's a paragraph here. The image or the idol was fed. They would feed him. In a ceremonial fashion, accompanied by music from offerings and the produce of the temple land and flocks, okay, when the god was eating... This is amazing. When the god was eating, he was, at least in later times, hidden from human view. Why would they do that? Because nothing's going on in there except food sitting in front of this stone thing or whatever it is. But he's eating. He's eating. We can't bother him. Right? Even the priests, hidden by linen curtains surrounding the image and his table, how did they, when the God had eaten, I don't know how they determined when he was done. Maybe it was how hungry the king was getting. The dishes from his meal were sent to the king for consumption. What was not destined for the table of the main deity, his consort, his children, or the servant gods, was distributed among the temple administrators and craftsmen. The quantities of food involved could be enormous. I think both of these things are on the table for Daniel and his friends. We're not going to eat unclean food, and we're certainly not going to eat food that's been sacrificed to the gods of Babylon. So whatever the specific point of conflict was with the law of God, the result of participating in the food regimen of the king would be defilement. This is serious for the Hebrew youths. The word means defilement to make morally or ritually impure, unholy, unholy. Now, I think this is key, and we're going to talk about this at length um, with regard to Daniel. Excuse me. 
the phrase made up his mind, made up his mind literally says, Daniel set his heart. It's got the Hebrew word for heart in it. He set his heart that he would not defile himself. Why is that important? Because, because the righteous and their lives are sourced out of a heart that's been changed by God. Okay? He would not defile himself. Daniel and his companions resolved to obey God by not defiling themselves was sourced out of hearts that were wholeheartedly devoted to their God. Ultimately, this is the key, the key to their persevering faithfulness, and it is the key to our persevering faithfulness, as we're going to see. They were men of faith with hearts circumcised, as the Old Testament calls it, or changed by God's saving grace to love him with all their heart and soul. This is what we see in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, which is a prefiguring of what's coming for them as a nation. But here, here's what it says. Because they're commanded in Deuteronomy to circumcise their hearts so that they can love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the way God wanted them to obey him and, and uh, interact with him was with this kind of heart. But the bottom line is they can't manufacture that heart. Only God can give it to them. And we read that in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Moreover, Israel, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. And that live is eternal life. We see that in the New Testament when Jesus references this text. But the bottom line is, <clears throat> God gives this kind of heart to his people, the ones that are brought into a love relationship with him. Okay? So we, we have to see that, because this just didn't happen for these men. It's the grace of God in their lives. They have the right kind of heart. So, Daniel and his three friends, they knew that the course of action they committed themselves to would bring them into conflict with the king's orders. They know that. Daniel's plan, and here's where we can begin to learn from him. Daniel's plan to deal with the issue of defilement was to be humbly respectful and approach the proper person in authority with his request that he and his companions be allowed to not participate in the king's food regimen. He sought permission, it says, from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. He was open and honest. He wasn't sneaking around trying to figure it out. He, he lays it out there with the authority over him, knowing, I think, that to even ask would possibly have consequences in an authoritarian society like Babylon. The, the king ruled absolutely in Babylon. If he didn't like your face, he could take your head off. He could change laws. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And we know that Daniel out of love for his God. <clears throat> See, this is important because he, he approaches this man in a wonderful way at first. But we know that love for his God, <clears throat> because of that, he was not going to compromise his faith and his obedience to God. So as he even comes with this idea Okay. He had to trust God, didn't he, for the consequences of his request and for God's will to be done as he sought to please him through obedience to his commands. And so when you, just a thought, we have faith and humility being demonstrated. Why can he 
humbly approach this man in this way, it's only because he knows the God that is God. That's the only way you can do that. How do men do what they want to do to change things? Man, we've got to we've got to get in there and take up arms, and we've got to make things happen. No, he, God can make things happen. He he can humbly approach this man and talk to him about the need because he knows his God. So here's a page three. I, I just want this thought hit me. There's nothing, well, there, there is some biblical evidence for this, but just let me share this with you because I think this is critical as we look at his heart. So I call this a point to consider, actually, the Jeremiah connection and Daniel's heart. The Jeremiah connection. What, what am I talking about? Crazy old man up there. Saying, as we consider the heart of Daniel and his resolve to live a life of faithful obedience to his covenant God, I think it's important to remember the context in which Daniel lived prior to being exiled to Babylon in 605 B.C. Now, just stick with me here. If Daniel was 14 or 15 years old when he was taken to Babylon, which... Many commentators agree with that kind of an idea, young man. It means that he was born around 620 B.C., 15 years later, 605. Jeremiah's prophetic career began in 627 B.C., the 13th year of Josiah's reign, and ended shortly after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. You can see that in Jeremiah 1, 1 through 3. This means, people, that his years, Daniel's years of growing up in Jerusalem would have been during the first half of Jeremiah's ministry to the nation, okay? What kind of ministry was that? A preaching, exhorting, calling them to covenant faithfulness. They're they're ignoring him, but not everybody As a, and as a youth who was a member of nobility, the nobility, or related to royalty, he's there when Jeremiah is in the face of the king proclaiming truth from God concerning their foolishness and apostasy. He would have been there. He would have been familiar as he got older with the prophetic, divine truth Jeremiah proclaimed to an unrepentant nation. And and it's possible, the thought is, it's possible, I'm sharing with you, that this ministry of truth may have been what God used to impact the heart of young Daniel. We also know that messages Jeremiah delivered were recorded for later study by those who desired to know what he said. Later in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to see that Daniel gets the books and he reads Jeremiah's prophecy about the 70 years and he starts praying for God to do what he said he was going to do through Jeremiah the prophet. So these things were recorded as he grew up in this context. Listen, people, Daniel's heart, his young heart may have been stirred by God's words through Jeremiah, say, recorded in Jeremiah 2, 1 through 19. Let me just read this to you. Young Daniel, hearing this maybe after the fact, recorded, talked about by others. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? 
They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you came and defiled my land. And my inheritance, you made an abomination. The priest did not say, where's the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. Wow. The rulers also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. What if he's hearing this? Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your sons' sons I will contend, which ultimately is exile from the land. So he says, for God says, cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see and send to Kedar and observe closely. Anywhere you go from east to west and see if there has been such a thing as this. Has a nation, a pagan nation, has a pagan nation changed gods? <laughs> when they were not gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns <clears throat> that can hold no water. Wow. Well, God may have used such preaching to impact Daniel's heart, right? With a desire to not forsake the fountain of living waters, to hew out for himself a broken cistern that could hold no water. Can't be dogmatic, but the Spirit of God uses his word to change the hearts of the unbelieving, and we know that Daniel <clears throat> was a young man who had a heart changed by God. And if there's a heart changed by God, people, it takes place through the word of God being proclaimed and the spirit of God using it to change the heart. So, let's talk some implications. I, the same thing is true for us, you know, with regard to the word. If you're not committed to seeing the beauty of Christ from the pages of Scripture, there's not going to be any change taking place in your life. Can't happen. <clears throat> what did Peter say? From beginning to end, you know, here's the beginning. Since you have an obedience to the truth, <clears throat> purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. Right? Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Dear people, from beginning to end, the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and transforms the child of God into the image of Christ. Same thing with Daniel. Okay, now I have a, a long implication here, so hang with me on this. <laughs> oh, you're getting some of thoughts that just impacted me this week. Implication for, for another page or so. Daniel's decision and the weight of its consequences is not unlike decisions 
that we as believers make every day as we live out our lives in the increasingly hostile environment of our nation. Okay? Uh, as was true for Daniel, in our present circumstances, there is a sovereignly designed conflict between two diametrically opposed worldviews, right? The domain of darkness and the kingdom of God's beloved Son, light, darkness. As Paul declares in Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle, just like Daniel's, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And that's not, this is no game. This is serious. And, and you know, most of us look at Daniel, and I'm I, myself included, and marvel at his life of obedient faith and love for God in the midst of intense, life-threatening, and difficult circumstances. We, th we think that we could not have lived so faithfully, maybe. But I, I, I'm here to, I, I want to I talk about this. Yet you and I as believers have been given the same kind of heart by the grace of God that Daniel had. <laughs> the circumcised heart promised in Deuteronomy 6.30 is the heart God gives to his children in the new covenant. That's the, that's the heart you're going to get if you're a Christian. Ezekiel speaks of this heart in chapter 36, 25 and following. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, God says. It's a new covenant text, and the new covenant's been inaugurated by Jesus Christ during this church age. And you will be clean. I'm going to cleanse you. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone, that dead heart toward me from your flesh and give you a heart that's alive toward me. Not only that, but I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Paul states in Philippians 3.3 3, that believers are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And he says in Colossians 2, and in him you also, saints, were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is the circumcision of heart spoken of in the Old Testament, which is directly tied, directly tied to the change of heart that's going on now in the New Covenant. And it's directly tied to what Jesus said in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus, you must be born again. He refers to the Ezekiel text. The idea that you must be given a new heart by the Spirit of God if you're going to enter the kingdom of God. So let's think a little bit about Daniel and us. The significant difference between Daniel and us is, is that we not only have a new circumcised heart like he did, but... Also, all the wonderful promises that come with the inauguration of the new covenant founded on the shed blood of Jesus Christ and being brought into union with him by grace through faith in his substitutionary, propitiatory death and resurrection. Daniel, get this, Daniel could not say with what Paul said in Galatians. He couldn't say this. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Daniel couldn't say that. 
That's true for us. This is great. Concerning our battle against the forces of darkness, mentioned in Galatians 6.12, Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Get this, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And Paul uses the same verb, put on, in Romans 3.14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Daniel could not put on this armor because he could not put on Jesus Christ. Couldn't do it. But you and I, as New Covenant believers, dear people, have been brought into union with Christ through faith in His death and resurrection. We have the unbelievable New Covenant blessing of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Daniel didn't have that. You have that. Just a reminder, Romans 6, 1 through 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead in the power of God's Spirit, through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been him, if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Here's the point. You're going, Pastor, what are you, you just, what are you, what are you talking, what's going on? Here's the point. Page five. Dear people, we have so much more promised to us in the new covenant with respect to our walk with God than Daniel did. <laughs> there are definite correspondences, but there are much greater blessings because Christ, the promised Son of Man, has come. The king of the eschatological kingdom has come accomplishing his suffering servant cross work and has been resurrected to the right hand of the Father in fulfillment of Psalm 110. Think about this. 2,500 years ago, what Daniel could only see as a glorious, somewhat enigmatic figure in a divine vision long ago, that son of man that you know, it's kind of mysterious. It's a messianic idea. But here's a man that's going to get the worship of God. How does that work? It's kind, of, it's kind of mysterious to Daniel as he gets the vision. This son of man, we now know and love as Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. We now know and love the one who is coming again on the clouds of heaven. We've seen him. We know him, Daniel. It wasn't that clear to him, but it is to us. With power and great glory to establish his glorious kingdom on earth, we are longing, loving, and looking for the one who will come and rescue us from the wrath to come. Dear people, as we fight the good fight of faith, now, for the glory of God, we are fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is something Daniel did not have the privilege to do, but you do. Daniel was not a super saint. Maybe some of you think, but he's a super saint. No. 
He was just like you and me. He obeyed God out of love for God, fear of God, and faith in God, and his unchanging person and promise, knowing that he would enter into blessing, not in this life. He spent his whole life in Babylon and died there. But at the time of consummation, at the end of the book, we read this. Daniel understood this. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, the righteous, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. He had an a hope that transcended his life in Babylon because of the promises of God. Right? However, you and I as saints have the unbelievable privilege of being the objects of the Father's new covenant grace in Christ, as Peter states, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you see the magnificent difference between Daniel and us? <laughs> Final implication. How much more should we reflect the faith of Daniel in our context? Truly knowing and loving the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Right? You guys are super saints compared to Daniel because of what you have come to know and who you have come to know and who is dwelling within you and what is happening as God changes your life. Isn't that amazing? There's no excuse for us. <laughs> Just no excuse at all. When I was teaching little kids long ago, one of the little, couldn't even see his knees, he's running around in his, he had a little shirt, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Okay, got to move fast. We're going to move fast. We can keep doing this, I think, real quick. In Daniel 1, then 9 and 10, now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander. Officials, commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your face looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. So in verse 9, we see the sovereignty of Daniel's and our God, our great God. Nothing's outside of his control, including the heart of the pagan commander of the officials. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> the text tells us that God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of this man. The verb granted is the same verb used up at the beginning of Daniel where it says God gave Jehoiakim, this king, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. God alone determines the path of nations and individuals as he accomplishes his sovereign will for both. Do you see that? He grants, he gives, he does. <laughs> Man, granted. The word favor, this is really cool is the Hebrew word hesed. You've heard that word before. That's loyal, loving kindness. It means unfailing love, loyal love, devotion, kindness, often based on a prior relationship, especially a covenant relationship. The word for compassion means feeling, feelings of love, a, a, a sensation of love or mercy towards somebody. Now, I'm telling you, this hard pagan commander of the officials would have none of that if it wasn't God doing it. It's unbelievable. 
Proverbs, it's a reflection of this, Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. As Daniel and his three friends trusted in God, they knew that he was in absolute control of their lives and circumstances, including ruling over those in authority over them. I think what's amazing, uh, well, first of all, in our day, we can't forget this. You know, in our day, in our nation, we can't forget who's absolutely in control of the heart of the king. It's the Lord Jesus. He rules over the kings of the earth right now. And he's coming again, and everybody's going to see it, but right now he controls. It doesn't matter if it's Joe Biden or the guy in China or the guy in Russia. It doesn't matter. He's doing his will. Isn't that great? He's in control of governments. Jesus is in control. And this idea of hesed then, see what's happening is hesed is a covenant term for God's love toward Israel. And so as this man has that kind of love for Daniel and his friends, guess what? It's a reflection of how God is preserving and working through the remnant of these righteous Jewish young men on behalf of his nation. Ezra 3.11, when they came back and were laying the temple, building the temple, they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And so he's dealing with these young men in that way, ultimately to set his name on display. God is moving the heart of Aspenaz, granting Daniel and his three companions, Hesed, in his sight as the righteous remnant and representatives of his elect nation. Even in exile, God's loving kindness toward his people cannot fail because of his faithfulness to the unconditional covenant promise he's made to them in Abraham and David, those great unconditional promises that are fulfilled by Jesus Christ. God is faithful to his word for the sake of his name, so the commander, you know, he has these feelings, but he's also afraid for his own neck. That, you know, it's just the way it is. So Daniel comes up with a creative proposal, page 7. This is kind of neat how this works. He comes up with a plan. He understood. You, re you can read the text. You know, let's go for seven days. Let's have a test. Give us the vegetables and the water, and we'll see what happens, and you can observe and decide what you want to do after that. He understood the conflict in the commander, and under God's hand, set forth a course of action to the supervisor placed over him who reports to the commander. This proposal of a test, doesn't this make sense? Just think about it. Um, was it, it was the right thing to do, uh, for, because here's what's going on. If you have this limited time during which any noticeable change in, in healthful appearance could be quickly noted by those watching over the Hebrew use, they could raise the flag. For 10 days, Daniel asked if he could have the vegetables and the water. This implies, I think, that he's not eating in the presence of the king, and the training that's going on is not in the presence of the king. They're going to see him later after three years, but the bottom line is they're isolated. They could do this and they could watch them and not violate the appearance problem if they are off the king's diet. So that short duration and test, under God's hand of wisdom and supervision, causes the supervisor to say, okay, let's do that, see what happens, right? I thought it was neat, Tanner said, it's not, you know, when I thought about the vegetables, I'm going, ugh. I, you don't ever tell Ron Troyer about this diet. It won't work. But the bottom line is for them, uh, the Hebrew word for vegetables is the Hebrew zer zeroah, which has the basic idea of that which grows from seeds. So this would include vegetables, fruits, grains, bread made from grains. This would have been quite a healthy diet, really, for them. The test then was simple. After 10 days, if they look fine, hey, we're good. Here's the implication. Daniel provides us with an example 
of finding a course of action that allows us to obey God in an increasingly dark society, I think. He was humbly respectful and creative in his proposal to the commander, right? The same result would probably not have occurred if he and his companions had immediately taken a hard-line stand against the king's directive, saying something like, as Jews, we are absolutely... We absolutely refuse to follow the king's food orders because we will not defile ourselves. How far do you think that would have gone? They're not being foolish, right? Now, but here's the flip side. They approached him the way they did, but there may come a time when an absolute hardline stand is necessary in our battle against sin and the enemy and a society opposed to God's word. And you know what? If, if what, what would have happened if the commander had said, I don't think so? Now, that, now those youths take a hard line and they give their lives up. They would have done it. We're going to see that with the fiery furnace. Yeah. I think that there were others besides those four. I, it, we don't have any more information that's possible. I think it's probably possible. But I'm not sure. But in either case, we must do what we believe is the wise course of action and trust God for the results of standing for his truth and honor. Right, people? But be wise. Be wise. Next page, 8. We're getting there. Now, Tanner just has a paragraph here at the top of page 8 that's kind of a, you know, the fact. He brings home an application or an implication. He says most of us at one time or another are confronted with situations in which we are asked to attend or tempted to compromise our faith. I think that's happening more and more in our society. For instance, we live in a culture in which business deals are sealed in the bar or with alcoholic drinks or a big party or whatever, and we may be expected to go along with this lifestyle or risk losing out on the deal. Or we might live in a culture where bribes are expected in order to secure someone's approval or to finalize a transaction. Or young people wanting to be part of a group may be expected to compromise themselves morally to be accepted by the group. Since we live in a world, he says, that generally does not accept God's values, system is more and more, by the way, there are many ways that each of us are being challenged all the time to make these kinds of moral choices. He says, will we be obedient like Daniel? Or will we compromise our walk with God for the sake of some temporal goal? And, you know, that's that's always on the table. But but be wise. You can't compromise your faith, but you can be wise and maybe creative like Daniel did, you know. Maybe you can't share Christ on the job in your workplace, but maybe you can go out to lunch with with one of the people that's part of your work group, and there you can do it. You don't have to push it if there's an alternative. Anyway, we need wisdom, but the bottom line is that we who are living for the glory of God must stand by his grace with uncompromising love in him, fear of him, and trust in him. Right? That's fair. Okay. The, the test was a successful outcome. We, we understand that. In, st- in fact, the commander's fears are turned on their head. These guys look more healthy than all the other guys, you know? That's what fat means. It means healthier, not like, you know, like me, more, but healthy, <laughs> healthier than all the other youths. So they, they keep them on that, that food regimen. Okay, now God, the last part of the text tonight, today is that God elevates Daniel and his friends. God's reward, 117, this is page 9. We're coming to the end, got a few more minutes. Now this, here we go. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge. God, 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 everything is about God. And intelligence. In every branch of literature and wisdom, Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. So, God's wonderful sovereign hand is on them. They're they're excelling in every area of the king's training program. Why? Because God gave them knowledge. 
and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. And this is so critical. God blessed Daniel in a unique way. Why? Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. That's a divinely given skill that's going to be very critical as we get to chapter 2. Right? And, and what's it all about? Why is God doing this? He's going to use Daniel and his friends in this pagan court of the most powerful pagan king in the ancient Near East at this time to exalt his name in this place through these young men. Who knows what God will do with you and a witness in whatever place God puts you if he wants to use you a certain way to exalt his name as you live faithfully for him. All is being done by God to set his name on display. It, that, that, that was true then, dear people, and it's true now. Everything about your life, all of your circumstances, everything that's going on, the good, the bad, the ugly, has one purpose, to exalt and set on display the Lord Jesus Christ as you're being conformed into his image and as you're reflecting that truth and being salt and light. It's about doing what God the Father's doing, setting his son on display. That's what your life's about now and forever. Isn't that great? And God's hand is on you to bring about this kind of wonderful influence in society. It may not be as dramatic as Daniel's influence, but God's going to use you to influence others and shine the light on his son. Well, the last thing we're going to talk about for a couple minutes... Are they still going in there? Yeah, and Sean can't see me, so he's still going. He doesn't... Okay, good. We're going to go for a little bit. The examination by the king. Can you imagine this? They're going to stand before this king. And if he doesn't like something about you, he can just chop your head off. He doesn't have to follow any rules. And they're going to get examined by him. Well, I hope that test goes well. Who cares about SAT tests and stuff? This is a biggie. At the end of three-year curriculum, the commander of the officials presents the four Hebrew youths and all the others in the training program before Nebuchadnezzar for examination. They underwent a personal examination by the king, and because God gave life, or I'm sorry, because God gave the Hebrew youths what they needed to excel, Nebuchadnezzar examines them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. They excelled everybody. Uh, and because of God's supernatural gifting, we're told, as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the rest of the magician, ma 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 magicians and conjurers in the land that are already his counselors. They're not in any training program, but they're better than the rest of these guys. They excelled everybody in his kingdom. Now, there's a good comment there about magicians and conjurers, and then we can move to the, the... Their whole purpose was to give the king insight through the occult, you know, all that bad stuff about what's going to happen. We're going to read some liver of some animal and tell you what's going to happen. We're going to read the stars, king, and we're going to tell you. They're conjurers and magicians. But the bottom line is Daniel had wisdom from God these youths did not participate in that stuff, but they excelled all the foolish, satanic stuff because God is God, and he's going to tell them the way it really is, and they're going to give counsel to the king that's absolutely true and wise because it's coming from God. Okay. And then there's one final comment about how long Daniel lived. This is really cool. He outlived Babylon. <laughs> he makes it through all the Babylonian kings into the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, and he knows God's going to do his will, and he sees it happen. And it says, at the, it says here at the end, um, this would mean that he served in Babylon for over 60 years through with 
probable interrupt, though with probable interruptions, and lived to see King Cyrus of Persia issue the decree permitting the Jews to return to the land. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. He lived to see God's faithfulness with Israel begin to be worked out. Okay, okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. (laughs) This book is not about Daniel, it's about you. This is a book about your greatness, your power, your glory, your majesty. Please help us to understand that what Daniel only saw from afar in terms of the Son of Man, we now know you, Jesus, personally. You are the Son of Man who's going to be coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And you love us and you released us from our sins by your blood. Thank you. May we be steadfast in our faith because we know and love you and are in union with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Dear God, amen.